Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, dear, dear participants. I think we can start. Uh, it is my great pleasure to open today's session, today Eden's, uh, today's Eden webinar, uh, Eden series actually of um, Eden app webinars. Um, I'm Igor Balaban. I am a professor at the Faculty of Organization and Informatics, University of Zagreb. I'm also Eden app steering committee member. And today we have a webinar entitled, What do I do as an educator with learning analytics? Uh, as you can see from the first slide, today we have five very interesting speakers and I would like to thank them as well um, for keeping the time with us, for preparing their presentations. Um, actually the main moderating uh, role today will be um, from uh, my dear colleague, Professor Bart Rientes. Bart is a professor of learning analytics and program lead of the learning analytics and learning design research program. Uh, he is with the uh, Open um, University UK Institute of Educational Technology. Uh, maybe just before we start, what was the main motivation for today's webinar? As you all might have known uh, so far, we have been extensively dealing with the learning management systems. And in some point in time, we realized that the systems were actually recording a large amount of data. They were actually recording uh, all data that uh, systems were, um, were recording by themselves or, or by default, but they are also be capable of recording the um, instructor-based data. And then we realized that that data can help us in a variety of terms, and then we started to analyze that data. And today's story is actually how can we use that data that we now popularly call learning data in order to, let's say, optimize learners' preferences, optimize learners' uh, learning experience, how to help, how to use the learning data to help teacher, how to cluster students, what can we learn from the learning data that is already inside the system is just that we need to dig the data out and start to analyze data. So um, today we will talk exactly about that. And now I would like to uh, give the floor over to Professor Bart Rientes, who will actually do the uh, main introduction and who will introduce today's speakers. Bart, please, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, uh, Igor. Thanks for the organizers for inviting us to this Eden webinar. We are very excited to share our experiences and we look forward to your questions, comments and insight. And I can see already from the chat that you've already started to chat, which is great. We've opened up also a question box. So if you have any questions during the presentations, just put them into the question box and we will either directly try to answer them or we'll um, try to answer those questions towards the end. Um, so in this interview, interactive webinar, we will share lived experiences how four organizations from six countries are using learning analytics on a daily basis. Some of these organizations have implemented learning analytics at an institutional scale, like Nottingham Trent or the OP University, while others have created more specific and bespoke applications and practices. Um, you will see today at least two organizations who provide rich learning analytics data directly to students, while in all four organizations we provide rich and aggregate data directly to all um, educators. So, for example, what you will see from the speakers who will join today, so for example, Ed Foster will uh, from Nottingham Trent data, uh, from Nottingham Trent University, he will demonstrate how students can easily access their own data and how um, this helps them to see how engaged they are with their uh, studies. Similarly, at Marset University, Dirk Templer will in a minute show how he's using his own um, course and how he is, he is developing um, basically their own students. Sorry, I'm losing my... Uh, my notes um, how 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 is how is giving this data directly to our his students um, in, in terms of their learning dispositions, their learning um, uh, engagement data, and how he's helping students to not only learn statistics but also to reflect on their own practice. Um, Anna Gillespie from the OP University will share her experiences of how using learning analytics to over three thousand teachers helps them to provide 
really useful advice to students using interactive dashboards. And she will highlight how predictive learning analytics systems could be used to help to support a teacher. And then last and not least, uh, Robert uh, Bodley from Zappi, he will illustrate how at Mountains High Academy, teachers are using a so-called action dashboard um, to, to basically understand how their students are learning and how to basically provide better data to teachers to potentially intervene with uh, struggling students. So what we will do in this webinar, we will not do a lot of technical um, um, data analysis. What we will mainly do is to focus on the role of the educator and how you as teacher or as educator could potentially use learning analytics in your own classroom. What we've indicated that each presenter has a maximum of seven minutes to share his or her amazing work and then there is a one minute opportunity to address any urgent questions um, so if you add that up that should be around 40 minutes of presenting and an opportunity for quick questions but then afterwards this should give us plenty of time to go much more into depth in terms of um, uh, you know the lived experiences so we're really looking forward to your questions and and answers and if we speak too fast or too slow do let us uh, know so let's get this show on the road so at the op university we've been using learning analytics since 2013 and what anna will show in a minute is that these tools are really amazing and powerful in terms of predicting students behavior what we also found was it's really important to understand how teachers design online and blended courses. And at the Open University for the last 15 years, we've used the so-called Open University Learning Design Initiative. In this approach, we're basically doing a kind of blueprint, a brain scan of how teachers design courses. So what you're currently doing is you're listening to me, which is a kind of a simulative activity. Perhaps at the same time, you're Googling who the F is Bart Rinty. So you're finding perhaps more information about the speakers. Some of you are already communicating in the chat and are asking interesting questions, hopefully. Hopefully also later there will be some opportunities for you to play with actual data from these various learning analytics platforms so you get a kind of productive experience of what it's like to, to work with um, certain uh, learning analytics data. And finally, all the way to the right, you see that typically, of course, we as teachers eventually often assess our students to what extent our students have understood um, you know, the main concepts that we're discussing. So these blueprints of seven main learning activities is a way of trying to identify what are the key activities that our teachers are using for their students. And what you see, for example, in the next slide is a kind of blueprint of one computer science course. And in this computer science course, you see a, a kind of brain scan of what a teacher thinks each student should spend in terms of their activity. So for example, in week one, a student is expected to spend 10 hours on reading materials and spend one and a half hours finding information, for example, what is Java or what is uh, HTML, et cetera, et cetera. And in this particular design, the teacher in week five designed a really engaging program activity task. So the students were expected to program a particular uh, piece of code, which is a kind of experiential activity which lasted for 19.1 hours that's the expectation of the teacher and that was then also assessed for on average 10.9 hours and what this this is a very smart guy this teacher indicated okay let's give the students then free the week beforehand so they have plenty of time to work on this program so you see the kind of expected workload that a teacher thinks typically would happen so now let's look at what students were actually doing so the next slide in a way shows exactly the same information but in a slightly different way so the bars basically show the, the, the workload expected by the teacher and the red line indicates the actual average engagement by students. And what you can immediately see is that in week four, students didn't go on holiday. They actually spend a lot of time um, working on this particular activity. They actually spend most of their time on this particular 
activity when they were supposed to be free. Another thing that you probably will see if you look with a clear eye to the data is that every time when there is a blue activity, that's a so-called assessment activity, there is a lot of engagement by uh, students. And the reason why we think at the Open University that this is so important is with any kind of learning analytics data, any kind of uh, data that you have, you will have peaks and troughs. But if you do not know what's behind those peaks and troughs, it's really difficult to make sense of this. So in a large number of studies, we have then been able to show that around 69% of what OU students are doing on a week by week basis is determined by how we as teachers design our courses, which is amazing if you think about it. So if you want to change your students, it's about changing you as an educator and thinking creatively about how you know you can optimally design your courses. So what we have done in some big data studies, um, we looked at over a hundred different courses at the OP University. And what we found was that teachers who design a lot of individual learning activities with lots of amazing materials, lots of interesting videos, um, they tend to lead on average to a lower engagement by students over time, while teachers who design mo more so-called social constructivist learning activities, and I'm sure that Dirk Templar will show an example of this later on, they tend to lead to higher engagement over time. And what we see in addition is that those teachers who design more constructivist learning designs are more focused on the individual learning tend to lead to higher learning satisfaction. While at the same time, those courses that have a lot of interactive and a lot of social constructive learning materials, they tend to get really low satisfaction. But at the same time, the number one predictor of whether or not our students are passing courses at the OP University is whether we let students work together in groups with a teacher. So this is really fascinating because it's great to look at all this learning analytics data, but what we're trying to basically say is that we as educators have a tremendously important role to set our students up for success. At the same time, by showing these dashboards back to teachers, and this is an example of the same computer science course, by showing this data back to teachers, as you can see, this teacher changed his learning design based on the information we were providing from this dashboard. So in week four, there was no longer a break and he made the decision to move the assignments in a slightly different way. And then we can start to track whether or not this is a good uh, approach or not. So if you're interested, and I, I will post a link in a minute as well, um, you can use this Aldi approach for free online and I'll post a link in a minute and you can play around with it in your own uh, time. So exactly with seven minutes i'm really keen to hear if there are any questions or comments and i will try to do that within one minute and then we will move to um, anna so is there any question or comment that we need to address sorry i'm just trying to find the um oh so there's one question in the chat. Yes, um, I'm that this is indeed data from uh, Moodle. And Marcus asks, have you had a bug change in learning patterns during, <laughs> during COVID? That's a, a big change in learning patterns. I mean, because of course, everything at the OP University is online. We basically continued as normal. So for us, there wasn't a massive change, but we have also been working with a lot of normal universities in between brackets and i'm sure that they have um, probably had to change quite tremendously and learning design allows you to kind of map this so this is my time up so i'm going to give the floor to anna so anna go ahead thank you can you hear me okay yeah oh that's brilliant well 
Um, thank you very much, Bart. And um, just as I won't spend a lot of time introducing myself because Bart's already done that, but just to say that I work as an associate lecturer. So my role is um, is, is direct teaching with students on particular modules. Um, and I use what we call the Early Alert Indicators Dashboard at the Open University. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about supporting teachers and supporting students who are working at distance. We'll go next one, please, Bart. Thank you. So one of the things as a tutor working at distance is that sometimes it's really quite difficult to know whether or not your students are actually still engaged in the module. And, and sometimes we get to a point where um, we may not actually even know that the student isn't engaging because, of course, we're not in a classroom situation. We don't see students. We can't stop somebody in the corridor and say, how are you getting on in that same way? So very often we're in a situation where the first time that we get to know that a student's kind of dropped off a little bit is when the submission deadline arrives and the assignment doesn't. So, of course, that's that that that's then quite worrying because that's quite a lot of time that's gone by and we've had no contact from a particular student, don't know what's happening. And best will in the world, students don't always communicate with tutors for a variety of reasons. It's not necessarily negative. Some students just prefer to do what they do um, and get on with it. And they may, you know, they, they may not really require an awful lot of um, tutor input. Um, we may find that some students um, have got particular um, situations whereby communica communicating isn't, isn't what they want to do, then that's why they're doing uh, online learning. So one of the things that we do have is the early alert indicators dashboard becomes a way for us as tutors um, to be able to offer support before it becomes too late for that particular student to catch up. So that's one of the things that um, we're really trying to encourage tutors to use as much as possible to make the best of, that we can out of the tools that we have. So as educators, we've got lots of tools in our toolbox. Um, so this is just an additional tool that we can use. So can I have the next slide, please? OK, so what the Early Alert Indicators Dashboard does is it provides us as tutors with manageable data. So it's visualisation and that's updated every week. And so to, to, form the, um, to, to form the data, there's two types of data. So it's the static data. So this is the demographic sort of uh, information. So this is the sort of things that um, students tell us on enrolment. So we will know bits about age, gender previous education, whether that's within the Open University or whether that's um, elsewhere. We know a little bit about their um, geographic um, information. So that's, that's, that's the sort of stuff that's kind of like static. And then we've got the fluid in, uh, data, which is student activities on the, uh, for example, um, the learning visual environment. So that's um, that's something that um, is really important to us, particularly as, as tutors, because actually that's the bit where we can actually change what's happening. We can't do an awful lot with the static data, but we can do with the fluid. So that's what is going to be the focus of the case study that I'm going to present to you now. So, OK, so what I'm going to do is I'm... Um, the, the slides that I'm going to show you now, they're an anonymised uh, example of a small section of the dashboard. So due to time, I've only got the time to sort of like show a small element of it. But the reason I've chosen this is because this is the bit that um, really where tutors can make a difference. So I'm going to present you with Dagmar. It's not her real name. And there's a long story behind what, how we, how our names are generated on this dashboard for anonymity. Um, so this is a, a real student, different name. She's 29 and she's studying at the Open University for the first time. It's her first module. It's in technology. And she is, she is working towards um, a BSc in engineering. So a new student. So if we can go to the next slide just show you some uh, demographics here. So basically, um, the brown trend line is Dagmar's activity on the, uh, uh, on the VLE at the moment. So that's, so we can see 
that and it's matched against the blue line, which is the average um, average student um, activity for that particular module. So what we can see when we're looking at the trend lines is actually Dagmar's doing okay. She's had a couple of dips, but generally speaking, if we look at it, her trend is certainly on track. So that's really reassuring. Now, if we look at the columns, what we can see there is the brown one is the results that Dagmar has had so far in, in her uh, assignments matched against the blue one, which is the, um, the average student again. So she's above average and that's looking really, really positive. The green one is an online um a piece of work that people uh, people submit it's it's um it's a small a small task really compared to the actual brown one so the dark brown one shows that activity as well and then again when we move to week 10 the line, um, what we can see is that dagma is still doing really really well and her engagement is really really positive so if we can move to the next slide now if we look at her trend line there if we go to week 14 what we can see is four weeks of non-activity. And that's quite, and actually when we, only very small amount for week 18. So what we've got there is a little bit of a worrying trend. Now, the thing about Dagmar is, as a tutor, I might not have been particularly worried about her unless I was able to see this data. But actually looking at week 14, 15, 16, and 17, is it, it's, it's a worrying trend. So the tutor who was... Um, tutoring um, Dagmar for this particular module she actually contacted her to see whether or not there was any problem so what we actually found out from this was that Dagmar had had a baby she hadn't told anybody that she was pregnant because she, part of the reason she's a woman on an engineering program and she was concerned she never studied at university level before and she thought that she would be asked to leave the module so she tried to keep it to herself that she'd had this baby. She'd also had some problems a little bit with postnatal depression as well. And she was at the point of thinking that maybe this was not for her. So if we can go to the next slide, just to finish us off, because I'm slightly over time. Finally, by the tutor picking up this up and engaging with Dagmar, we can see that actually that was the point at which she actually peaked and completed the module. So we can see we can see that she actually had a big lift at the end, and she was fine. She finally did complete. But what I think is important about this particular case is that the fact that she dipped in the middle um, and flatlined that could quite easily have been missed without having access to this particular data. And thank you very much. <laughs> Great, Anna. That's a really Sorry, lovely, <laughs> really lo lovely story. I'm, I'm going gi to give like one minute for any urgent questions. So if you have any urgent questions in the, you know, post it in the uh, question poll or post it in the chat. Um, and if you don't have any questions, that's also perfectly fine. S storm in the back of your mind. So there's one question um, um, by Marcus. Can you remind me what CMA and TMA stands uh, for? Yeah, sure. So. Uh, they're, they're very specific. Um, there's very specific U, uh, OU step. CMA means computer Mon uh, moderated assignment, and TMA is tutor marked and assignment. So we do have some uh, unusual statements. I must admit. Mm. So at the same time, there are lots of questions appearing in the in the question mark, which is great. So Anna can perhaps look at this okay. while we're. Uh, and if I go to the next presenter, so the next presenter will be Ed. And so keep your questions coming and we keep on trying yeah. to answer them. Thank you. Ed, it's all yours. Thanks, Bob. Okay, so um, I'm also going to talk quickly um, and I'm going to try and cover the ground on how we use learning analytics to support students during the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. So it's a, it's a very specific case study. Conceptually, the work that we do is very similar to the stuff that Anna's just described, but I'm going to take a slightly different tone on it. Um, I was thinking of going who heart to change, change screens, but just can we have next slide screen, please, Bart? Okay, so um, we are... Um, at NTU, Nottingham Trent University, where I work, we started our journey in learning analytics in 2013-14, and I just want to, I need to cover some of the basics quickly to, to give the context to the case study. So our focus is on the students, our focus is on student success, completing the course, progressing to the next year, and we focus on student activity. So qu quite similar in many respects to the, to the example that, that Anna's just given. 
we're looking as much, as far as we can at what we call educationally purposeful activities that that north american concept of engagement with activity that counts all the way through we try and frame this in the positive so when we talk about high we are talking about students who are highly engaged not students who are highly at risk um obviously we recognize that what we're looking at these data sources that we've got within um our systems are only proxies we know that we're not mind readers and we never will be um and i think i need to stress that we don't measure socioeconomic disadvantage so all that we're looking at in our system is those activities that a student is involved with we don't calculate in um filters based on student background because actually what we find is on the whole the disadvantages that hit students are the ones that continue to affect them on their life through university life through university um and i need to stress it's a resource that's available for both students and staff so students can see their own engagement data in comparison with the, their peers as can their staff and although the work that we started um is very much built around um a partnership of proce process where we put a lot of our intellectual property in we're using an external tool by a company called solution path the thing i want to stress is at the point where we have data we have three ways that we expect it to be used the first of these is students themselves so students can see their own data and use it to regulate their own learning what we found is that those students who are already quite good at learning are the ones who tend to use the resource the most secondly what we've got is um staff support success so staff making an intervention and the last one is the larger scale institutional level stuff so bar if you can just press the next screen please so just to re-emphasize, re we've got students with high, good, partial, low, and very low engagement. Next slide, please. So I just want to take two things away from this. I apologize. It was in a wide diagram, and then it got rescaled and rescaled again. But the basic point is this. I would argue that there's two steps involved in how we use learning analytics to support students. The first is our data processes, and the second is the work that we do around supporting our students. So the data processes are the stuff that you may be more familiar with, the supporting students, using the model that we're using for one of our uh, Erasmus projects. We start with a trigger, what's the thing that leads to an intervention? We look at the communication, so how do we get to those students? And finally, we look at the intervention itself. And I'm going to focus on an activity that we did in the summer of last year. So next slide, please, Bart. So this is the summer calling campaign. This is an activity where we run a coaching um, call campaign for our students in recognition of the difficulties that they were facing around um, the transition into the COVID-19 world. So next slide, please. Thank you. Okay, so in the UK, higher education teaching was locked down on Monday the 23rd of March, and we had a fortnight before then where it was a little bit uh, disrupt or significantly disrupted. Our concern was that we knew that there would be some students who would be significantly affected by this through issues of digital poverty, or probably also motivation and that slightly strange disembodied sense of the world being turned upside down. We know that within our institution, we cope with some of the digital poverty issues by the fact that what we do is we provide computers and workspaces. But of course, if you're working from a family home, that suddenly becomes inaccessible to you and is a really profound problem. We also know from our previous work that the students most at risk and most in need of support are also those least likely to seek help themselves. So what we did is we set up a call campaign where we took data from the dashboard, we took average data for the last average engagement for the last two weeks of the spring term, and we then made a commitment to contact all students in the institution who had low or very low average engagement for that period of the two weeks immediately prior to the end of the spring term. Next slide, please. So what we did is we ran an intervention with 30 volunteers. We made just over 5,700 phone calls and we spoke to 2,300 students. And within that, we made an, or 708, 780 referrals to professional services or on to personal tutors. What I would stress is, again, I want to repeat a point, we don't use socioeconomic disadvantage as part of our system. And yet when we looked at the students that we called, they were disproportionately from disadvantaged backgrounds. So those disadvantages that hit them prior to coming into higher education continue to disrupt um, and, and dislodge their learning processes. When we spoke to our students, overwhelmingly they appreciated the call. For most students, it was just a, thanks very much, You know, I'm quite grateful for the call. For others, actually it led to a, a more significant change in behavior behavior. But I want to also stress that although our tutors were very grateful for the interventions, what we found is that there was a lot of confusion at that time and a lot of lot more information was wanted from colleagues. And um, so, you know, wherever, whatever we do, it needs to fit into the institutional framework. And then next slide, please. And two quick quotes. 
So this one, I'll trot out and forever. It was a student piece of feedback that the student said, despite everything happening in the world, I wasn't forgotten about or abandoned by uni. And in many respects, that's what we're aiming for. It's just that point of contact, that point of reassurance. And the next one is also from a tutor. It was really helpful to know that there was a safety net supporting you to help students engage and who were not responding to you. It also made you feel like it wasn't all down to you and took off some of the pressure. So this is our team of volunteers stepping in and supporting the personal tutors who would normally offer that support out to students. And then last slide, please, Bart, or last but one. So just a couple of quick things. Number one, it was a huge problem to fit this on top of existing systems. So we at our institution have a process whereby personal tutors are the person who does most of the contacting students where there's an issue. Dropping this call centre onto the top of that did create some issues and continues to create some issues. But we think there's something here really important about scaling up the work that we do to offer support to students through the use of learning analytics. Secondly, identifying a student's nothing like the same as a successful intervention. A lot of these students were deeply wary and concerned around being contacted and, and didn't answer the phone calls or, or took a number of attempts to get through to them. And I just want to reiterate something that we're using from our um, current piece of Erasmus Plus research, three steps to intervention. What is it that sets off the intervention in the first place? How do you communicate what gets through? And then how do you structure the intervention? And that's the last of the presentation. And does anyone have any questions? And if you want me to slow down, it's a bit late. <laughs> no, this was perfect, Ed, as always. So um, we have one and a half minutes left, so well done. Um, so there are some really good questions already in the um, in the, the, the chat as well as on the online forum. So keep them going. Also vote them up and down. Uh, um, so Ed, do you just want to take any question you want? or? Okay, so, so I'll just take the one that's... So how do we help students who are not so good at learning? I've gone for the short one. How do we help <laughs> students who are not so good at learning to use insights and improve their study behavior? Um, that's a real problem for us, I think. Um, I think that where we survey our students um, around their engagement, I, I'm giving you a long answer to say I'm not sure yet. Um, the, 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 sh the longer answer is that what we've found is that where we survey students and we ask them around, what do you think, what's your perceived average engagement in a normal week? And then how do you respond to having your data in the dashboard? Overwhelmingly, those students who say my engagement in a normal week is normally good or high, those are absolutely the students who say, and seeing my data on the dashboard motivates me. For the ones whose engagement is very low or low, they're much less likely to say that they're motivated by it, and they're much more likely to say they find it stressful. So if I'm honest, I think there's probably a limit to what we can do. And I actually feel that for us, that strategy of having a personal tutor being involved or having a different intervention, such as the call center, is a more realistic way of targeting and getting to those particular students. It may be that we can find ways of using nudge approaches to communicate to those students and really inspire them. But my honest feeling is that at the moment, the priority is these students may not be confident enough to adapt or change their learning. And therefore, what we need to do is we need to offer staff interventions of some description. Um, OK, I'll stop there and I'll type into the answers short in a minute. Yeah, and, and keep the questions coming. It's great to see so many questions uh, appearing and we will come also back to some of the questions later on. So next, uh, Derek, you're up. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, if you, you ask me, I can summarize my uh, my uh, my speak in in, in seven uh, seconds rather than seven minutes. And it is don't forget learner data. Uh, the previous speaker, as well as Igor, uh, emphasized uh, catching learning data and trying to my make models of that learning data. What I am doing is. Next, combine that learning data with learner data. And that's different learner data than Ed uh, indicated. Uh, what we are collecting is what we call dispositional data. Next, please. Um, so that's the mainstream learning analytics. It's strongly focused on what student on learning activities. And from those learning activities, you can do uh, see two different things. The one is what is called process data, uh, how active students are, and then the outcomes of these activities, which is called the product data. And typically product data is data which you, for instance, see in formative assessments. Next, please. Um, the, but in my own teaching, as uh, which is 
um, so the difference between my teaching and uh, of my case study and the previous case study is that I am a teacher in mathematics and statistics. So I am working on a micro level, not on, a, on an institutional level, but in one course. And this is the, the typical course, which is an introductory course in mathematics and statistics, which has two characteristics. First of all, it's a large course, more than 1,000 students. Second, uh, it's, uh, the students in my course are very heterogeneous, so you would like uh, to have them uh, in individual learning paths to really personalize the, the learning, like, for instance, Timothy McKay um, is advocating. Please, next. Um, and the way we make it personalized is by using dispositions. Dispositions are introduced by David Perkins in the Harvard Project Zero, uh, where he defined dispositions as everything you need for good thinking. Um, and quite often we focus on the first, uh, which is called ability or skills. But David Perkins made quite clear that beyond ability, you need uh, two uh, further uh, elements. And that's the, what is called the inclination, the motivation, but also the sensitivity, to, uh, the ability to notice opportunities. That's the theory of uh, David Perkins. Um, in our learning analytics world, uh, the dispositions are well known by the work of Simon Buckingham Schum and uh, Ruth De Deacon Crick. Uh, Deacon Crick developed an instrument uh, for effective lifelong learning, which is called uh, the ELLI, uh, and which is also um, a, a measure of, uh, of dispositions, of characteristics of students. Please, next. So um, in the Maastricht uh, exa example, what we are using is a lot of learning data. Uh, we have uh, e-tutorial systems. We uh, see what students are doing in these e-tutorial systems. Uh, next to that, we have a lot of uh, formative assessments. So we see also products of it, but also we collect data, which is about the dispositions of our students. And such data is uh, based upon uh, uh, instruments for cell theories, on effort beliefs, on attitudes, on learning approaches, learning emotions of different types, motivation, engagements, um, uh, autonomous and controlled motivation. So these are all constructs uh, developed in cognitive social uh, educational theories uh, which are based on self-reports of students. Eh? So students answer those instruments and um, build a personal database. And we are using that personal database in the sense that also students are analyzing those, uh, those data themselves, eh? are doing a statistical analysis of that. But we are combining such data with the data we catch from the learning environments. Please. So a typical uh, application uh, of this is given over here. So what we do, as most of the users of learning analytics do, is try to develop prediction models. And here we try to develop prediction models in a longitudinal way. So over time, we collect more data and see how, uh, how good that data is in predicting learning outcomes. And the, the top... Uh, graph, you will see how good we are in predicting learning outcomes based on only uh, activity data. And the second one, we add to that activity data also product data, formative assessment. And what you see is there's a, a huge jump in the predictive power of our models uh, since uh, that um, formative assessment data does quite well. However, not in the early start of, of the course. And as you see in the third and the last uh, graph, there we add our disposition data. And you see that the disposition data helps a lot if you are predicting um, early in the, in the course uh, what students are going to do in the final exam. Next one, please. So what are typically good instruments, good uh, dispositions to use? Uh, one one of the most successful ones we are using is the instrument motivation and engagement window of Andrew Martin, which uh, has cognitive uh, versus behaviors in it, and it has uh, focusing on adaptive versus maladaptive uh, uh, cognitions and behaviors. 
um, such as learning focus, planning, persistence, study management. You can see it in the graph. Next, please. Uh, one which is also very well known is the Dweck's mindset theory, where you distinguish the students on uh, their cell series. Uh, so either being an entity or an incremental uh, thinker, um, and then uh, how they see effort, effort for learning as a negative thing or a, a positive thing. And what we typically do is, for instance, apply cluster analysis to, to distinguish different groups of students and see how these grouping is related to their, um, their um, uh, exam results. Next one. And I think it's the last one. So the big advantage of uh, using dispositional learning analytics is that when you find, um, for instance, such typical clusters, it's much more easy to connect your findings with uh, uh, an intervention. Because if your you, you, university offers brain uh, knowledge type of intervention, which is based on Dweck theory, then you, you would use uh, Dweck's instrument as learning disposition and offer students an uh, intervention uh, focusing on their uh, mindsets. Or the other way, if you use your the Martin's instruments, you can offer students, for instance, uh, interventions in terms of study management or addressing learning anxiety. And so that's the big advantage beyond getting better predictions is that you also have better interventions. Okay, that's it. Right, so we have 40 seconds left. So Alfredo <laughs> asks, do learning styles play a, work, a role in your workload, in your, in your model? Yeah, not, not so much the learning styles as traditionally. So what we do is, we, uh, as one of the instruments, we apply the different learning, uh, learning styles, but that's not the learning styles as most of the people see it. Okay, so um, I'm mindful also of time. So um, the, the, keep the questions coming for Derek as well in the chat, and then we will, uh, last but not least, go all the way to Utah, where, I've, where we've heard that you can do amazing skiing. So Robert, over to you. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, really happy to be here and happy to talk to you all. I'm gonna talk about an action dashboard today. So moving from an actionable dashboard to an action dashboard. Go ahead and hit the next slide. So here's a, an assortment of what you might consider a traditional dashboard. Lots of pretty charts and graphs, some line charts, some pretty colors, uh, you know, all arranged in a, in a nice, uh, nice visualization that is easy to look at. Uh, Bart, go ahead and do like maybe three or four slides. Uh, the main questions here that, uh, that form kind of the foundation of my thoughts on an action dashboard are uh, questions like, what are you supposed to see in all of the data? Where are the calls to action? A call to action is like on a marketing website, you have a button and they just want you to click the button. So it's buy this product or it's, you know, join my course or whatever the call to action is. Uh, usually there aren't calls, calls to actions on dashboards, uh, especially maybe not in a in an educational dashboard for an educator, there isn't like a button that says, you know, click here to contact the student or reach out to the student. Uh, how are you supposed to know what data you want to focus on? How do you know what the data means and what literacies are required to go from dashboard to action? You can imagine looking at a dashboard and needing to have some sort of graph literacy and uh, information literacy, maybe even some instructional design literacies in order to know what to focus on and then how to act based on what you see. So go ahead and hit the next slide. Uh, so this is kind of a little summary of what I would call a traditional dashboard. You bring all your data into one place, you display data with charts, graphs, and you make data easily accessible. An action dashboard is going to be a little bit uh, more focused than that. It's more like a data-driven to-do list. It's going to tell you what to do, not just show you data. It's going to make it easier to act. It's going to call your attention to specific urgent items, and it's going to be extremely intuitive. So now I'm going to give you uh, an, an example of an action dashboard that we've been working on for the past year. Go ahead and go to the next slide. So this is our action dashboard. 
Uh, you can see along the left side, there are a bunch of different groups, like trying but struggling. These are students that are highly active in your course, but are uh, still failing. So they have a 60 or below uh, for their grade. Uh, you can see there are other groups inactive in all courses, inactive in your course. Uh, to get all of this data, we integrate with the LMS, so Moodle in this case, and then we also integrate with the student information system, and we pull all of that data together and then display it here in this action dashboard. And I mentioned it's more like a data-driven to-do list because you can see the done column over on the right side where you can just, you know, once you reach out to a student, you can click done. Uh, yeah, go ahead and hit the next. Uh, you can see that we have a clear call to action here. So we want teachers to reach out to students. And so we have this nice kind of darker button where teachers can just click. They can mark how they're going to reach out to the student. Maybe it's a video call. Maybe it's a phone call. Maybe it's just a text or an email. And then uh, when they're finished, they can mark done. And that kind of, you know, checks off that student for, for the day. Uh, go ahead and go to the next. Uh, you can see we have little progress indicators here. So like I mentioned, kind of like a to-do list, teachers can see uh, how many at-risk students they have in each of these different groups. Uh, like I mentioned before, there's that little box on the right-hand side, so it's easy to check off uh, when, uh, when you've reached out to a particular student, you can check Check them off, uh, go to the next one, Bart. Uh, you can see a little bit of relevant in context information here. So it says when the teacher has last contacted the student. So we're implementing this with an online high school here in uh, Utah in the USA. And they have, they're supposed to reach out to every student in all of their courses at least once every two weeks. And so we facilitate the tracking so it's really easy for them to know who haven't I contacted recently and who do I need to reach out to. Uh, hit the next one. Uh, you can see at the top here, we have a few different things to make it easier for teachers. There's a course and group filter in the upper left. And then in the upper right, we have message templates. So each group, a teacher can create their own custom template message for this group. So for the trying but struggling group, your template message might be, hey, I see that you've really been trying in my course. You know, you have high, high activity and you're still struggling, you know, well, can you tell me what's going on? Uh, but each teacher can customize that for every group. Uh, so this is what we're calling an action dashboard. You can see that it's quite a bit different than maybe a traditional dashboard. We don't have any pretty charts and graphs, uh, but we're really focused on helping teachers reach out to students in the easiest way possible and kind of removing all of the graph and data literacies required to interpret the data and then act based on what you see. Uh, yeah, go ahead and, okay, so this is my last slide. Uh, and, I wanted to just do a quick comparison of uh, what we've been seeing so far with teachers. So you can see on the left-hand side, these are questions you might want to ask as an educator. Uh, determine which of my students are trying but struggling. See which students have been inactive in my course over the past seven days. See which student grades have gone up or down significantly since last week. See when I last contacted all of my students to know whether I should reach out again or not. These are all questions educators might have. And in traditional dashboard tools or even like in the LMS or in the SIS, it's going to take you five to 15 to 30 minutes, depending on where the data lives and how you get access to it. Sometimes you have to do it student by student. And in this action dashboard view, you can answer all of these questions in 10 seconds or less because it's been designed in a way to facilitate answering those questions. Uh, so we've seen a lot of success with uh, helping teachers use learning analytics data in their practice a lot more efficiently and effectively uh, using this kind of action dashboard. Thanks, Robert. Um, there are three really amazing questions already in the in the question box. So pick any one you like. Yeah. Um, let's see. Do these actions get tracked? So all teacher 
activity in the tool is tracked, meaning that when they log a communication, we send it back to the SIS and it's also logged in our platform. And so that's how those communications are tracked. Mm -hmm. uh, have you been considering working on student-centered dashboards? Yes, we would love to do a student version. We've been actually thinking about a student parent version of the action dashboard where you could imagine missing assignments or other kinds of things. Uh, we've only been working on it for the past year, so we'll, we'll get there eventually. Uh, where can I get this action dashboard? Uh, we do integrate with Moodle. Uh, I mean, feel free to contact me and uh, we can we can see if we can make something work uh, if, if there's interest. Right. So I think we have 10 minutes left, Igor, right? For an, an open round robin for any question that we haven't answered or any question that is in the back of your mind. Is it possible for people to speak, um, Linda or Igor? I mean, it's up, up to you what we want to do in the last 10 minutes. Yeah, I think that sure, we should encourage people yeah, to post questions. So please. So somebody wants to see the action dashboard again. So here you go. <laughs> I mean, Bart, you were ultra fast in replying to the questions. I've never <laughs> seen such speed in an organization. <laughs> I'm not sure if we if we said the right thing. And um, there was a question from Angelos uh, in the chat um, for Anna. Anna, um, the predictions of the OU analyzed, um, predictions on static demographics data are insights from the OU or from other studies? That comes from YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, I'm just trying to find my camera. <laughs> um, this, so, so the static information comes from students at enrollment. So when they enroll on the modules, um, that, that data is collected already. So we, 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 we collate that information to, to understand a little bit more about them. Um, the fluid information is based on things such as demographics. So it might be related to, for example, where a student lives. Um, it might be related to um, how their, their experiences in relation to others, what we would expect, what we call the nearest student. Um, so, yeah, it's, it, it's a variety. And I mean, it uses a lot of algorithms um, to be able to gather that uh, fluid inf uh, information as well. So um, lots of things to help us to try to, to find the predictions. One of the things that we use is looking at specifically at demographics at where people where people are in the country or where they are in the world in relation to how that might impact on their education. Um, yeah. Okay, there's a question from Zifa Kami. How do we trigger interest in a country like India where diversity is, is, is huge? And I think this is a really good question. I've also seen the question from Paul Prinslow about in the global south, there are of course different contexts in which learning analytics may or may not work. So does anyone want to chip in how you know, your approach, your way of working, how could it be scaled to different cultural contexts? Is anyone brave enough to answer this question? I mean, I may as well speak. Um, <laughs> someone's got to. Um, I, I guess it comes back to, it's, it's that, I think a lot of the work that we do in learning analytics is, is ultimately it's a kind of management case study or organizational case study. So in so many respects, the question comes back to what's the model of support that's on offer for students and, and what's the resource base for that? And then I guess it comes back to, okay, you know, does, does having data or risk data a week earlier, a month earlier, or however you want to define it, what difference does that actually make? And until that question's answered, I'm not sure that learning analytics per se actually adds very much. So, so obviously, and that's speaking from the perspective of ours and the Open University's approach around kind of remedial support. If we're taking the work that Bart does around that kind of predicting or curriculum design, again, there's, there's a different set of criteria or benefits that you can gain from that particular approach.
So there are lots of good questions appearing in the chat. So uh, Robert, there's one for you in the chat. Can you tell if teachers or learners ever feel that the diagnosis of the system on the actions are inappropriate or appropriate, Robert? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. Uh, in our case, we actually allow teachers to customize the groups. And so teachers can create their own what they believe to be an at-risk group. So a teacher that's taught a course for a really long time might know that if a student doesn't do very well on the first exam, then they're not gonna do very well on the second or third exams in the course. And so they could create a specific group for students that did poorly on the first exam that also had low activity in the second week of the course or something like that. Uh, and by teachers creating their own groups, we're kind of trusting the educator to know what the at-risk groups are and then the the teacher can then reach out accordingly based on that does that does that answer the question yeah brilliantly and also coming back to um, some of the questions that were raised before in terms of the the technicalities um for, for OE um, that's a, an, a program that is um, outside Moodle and basically scrapes data from Moodle. Um, another question that was raised in terms of, um, you know, how do you scale this? I've just posted in the link and I realized that I was posting it only to the panel members rather than to all attendees. And apologies for that. Is um, the paper that I just posted was a really relatively small um, administrative intervention that we did with 500 learners because we didn't have sufficient finance to do it with all 10,000 uh, students. But very similar to what Ed was saying, just having the opportunity to call this particular group at risk can have a massive influence on those students, not only in the week or the day itself, but we showed that there was a kind of longitudinal impact. The, the question which keeps me awake, awake at night, what happens to the other 9,500 students that we didn't call at that particular point in time? So it is a really difficult ethical and moral issue as well. Um, so I'm mindful of time. We have two minutes left. And I mean, we've agreed with the panel members we would stay longer online if needed, but I'm also mindful that you, 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 you have busy lives. So is there any urgent question that we haven't answered that you um, that you want us to address before we give the floor back to Igor. Um, See any other question arising in the chat? The question and answer box. No, I think it's it. I mean, we uh, it's easy to find all our contact details, so just Google. And uh, we're, we're happy to talk more if needed. Thanks, Igor. Over to you. Good. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Bart. Thank, thank you, all speakers. Thank you, um, uh, thank you participants, for uh, sharing this uh, afternoon hours with us. I hope. It was a very pleasant journey as for you as or as for me as for you because I've listened to this in a heartbeat. Those are very interesting topics. So thank you again um, uh, for spending time with us. As Bart indicated, uh, uh, the contacts of our distinguished speakers uh, can be very easily found. So please do not hesitate to uh, send them an email if you have any other questions that uh, you still find. Um, missing an answer in the in the in the in the chat box, or that we did not uh, manage to address uh, during this session. So thank you very much again. Thanks uh, for uh, thanks to Eden App for organizing this. Thanks for speakers for accepting the call. Thank you very much, and have a pleasant day.